فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم The first opinion, however, is more correct as it is reported in the two authentic books that the Prophet would say Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Kahr and name other chapters in the same manner. So this view that says that you can't say Surah Al-Baqarah is incorrect. It can be called Surah Al-Baqarah. It can be called Surah Al-Imran. The companions of the Prophet are also reported to have done the same. Ibn Mas'ud is reported to have said, This is the place where Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed to him, meaning that the Prophet ﷺ, he is also reported to have said, I recited Surah Al-Nisa to the Prophet ﷺ. There are numerous other ahadith and reports from the predecessors illustrating this point. The word as-surah, meaning chapter, may be pronounced in one of two ways. In order to illustrate these two methods of pronunciation, it would be clearer to join the word itself to a word preceding it, such as ma, such as mana, uh, a surah, which means the meaning of the chapter. And so, according to the first pronunciation, one would say mana a surah, where the a is, where the a in s is ax, is accent, is accent, accentuated and sharper. The second pronunciation would be man as surah, where the a would sound lighter and feel as though it were part of the first word. The second of the two pronunciations is the more eloquent, as this is the way it was pronounced in the Quran. <coughs> Among those who mentioned these two methods of pronunciation is the Ibn Qatibah in his book. Al Ibn Qutaybah, yeah. Qutayba. Ibn Qutaybah, yeah. Ibn فصل في حكم نسبة القراءة إلى العمة القراء ولا يكره أن يقال هذا قراءة أبي عمر أو قراءة نافع أو حمزة أو الكسائي أو غيره ماذا هو المختار الذي عليه عمل السلف والخلف من غير إنكار وروى ابن أبي داود عن إبراهيم النخعي رحمه الله أنه قال كانوا يكرهون أن يقال فلا كان يك كانوا يكرهون أن أن يقال سنة فلان وقراءة فلان والصحيح ما قدمناه section it is not disliked to refer to a reading as the reading of Ibn Abi Omar or the reading of Nafa Nafai Nafai or Hamza or Al Qasari or others among the known reciters. This is the opinion upon which the first generation and those who came after them agreed upon completely. However, Ibn Abi Dawood narrated that Ibrahim al nakhayi may Allah have mercy on him, stated that, the, that perhaps, referring to some of his temporaries, dislikes that one say, this is the sunnah of so-and-so, or this is the reading of so-and-so. The first view, however, is the correct opinion on this issue. Here is a question, issue which is, is it permissible to say that this is the recitation of Abi Amr and the recitation of Nafi'? This is the recitation of Kisa'i. And these are Qur'an. These are the top scholars who had different dialects of recitation of the Qur'an. Are we allowed to attribute the recitation to them? Or is it not allowed? This is a question that has been put forward. And Imam al-Nawawi says, what is the chosen opinion and the correct opinion is, and the pious predecessors would do, and the, seller, and the scholars who came after, is min ghayri inkar. They wouldn't reject that. They would allow that to be done. Except that it's been narrated from Ibrahim al nakhai that he disliked the idea of saying that this sunnah is a sunnah of so-and-so, or this is the khira'ah of so-and-so. He didn't like the idea. But what we say is the view of Imam al nawi which is, was sahih ma qaddamnahu. That is permissible. فصل في حكم تعليم القرآن للكافر لا يمنع الكافر من سماع القرآن لقول الله عز وجل وإن أحد من المشركين استجار كفاجر حتى يسمع كلام الله ثم بلغ مأمنه ويمنع من, مس ويمنع من مس المصحف وهل يجوز تعليم القرآن قال أصحابنا إن كان لا يرجى إسلامه لم يجوز تعليمه وإن رجي إسلامه ففيه وجهان الصح ما يجوز رجال إسلامه والثاني لا يجوز كما لا يجوز بيع المصحف منه وإن رجي إسلامه 
وأما إذا رأينا يتعلم فهل يمنع في وجهان نعم In Surah Tawbah, Ayah 6, and if any one and if any one of the polytheists seeks protection from you, grant him protection so that he may hear the speech of Allah. However, they must be prevented from touching the Mus'haf. With regards to teaching disbelievers the Quran, our companions have stated that if there appears to be no hope of the individual accepting Islam, he is not to be taught. If, however, there appears to be some hope, there are two opinions as to the permissibility of teaching it to them. The more correct of the two opinions is that it is, it, that it is indeed permissible, permissible in the hope that they will accept Islam. The second opinion states that it is not permissible, just as it is not permissible to sell the Mus'hafs to them, even if, they are, even if there is hope that they will accept Islam. There are also two opinions as to whether or not it is necessary to prevent a disbeliever from, hit, from learning the Qur'an if he is seen learning it. Can a disbeliever listen to the Qur'an? The answer is yes, he can listen to the Qur'an. There's evidence for that. Allah says, وَإِنَ أَحَدٌ مِّنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرُوا حَتَّى حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ أَبْلِغُ مَا مَنَا That if this disbeliever comes for refuge, then give him refuge and let him hear the verses of Allah. So he can listen to the Qur'an. But is he allowed to be taught the Qur'an? There's two opinions. There's two opinions. One opinion they say, it is allowed. With the condition that it's what? That his Islam is hoped. That's the first opinion. The second opinion, they said, it's not allowed even if he's, his Islam is hoped. No. Just like he's not allowed to be given a mushaf, he can't be taught the Quran. No. That's what they said, some of them. Yeah? Yeah, Faslun, section. Faslun fi hukmi kitabati al Quran li ruqya. Ikhtalaf al ulamai fi kitabati al Quran fi inain thumma yusal wa yusqahu al marid. قال الحسن ومجاهد وابو قلابة والأوزاعي لا بأس به وكرهه النخعي قال القاضي حسين والبغوي وغيرهما من أصحابنا ولو كتب القرآن على الحلوى وغيرها من الأطعمة فلا بأس بأكلها قال القاضي حسين ولو كتب على خشبة كره إحراقها the scholars hold different views regarding the act of writing the Qur'an in a vessel and then rinsing it so that a sick person may drink from it as a form of treatment. Al-Hassan, Mujahid, Abu Qilaba, and Al-Awza'i, may Allah have mercy on them all. They all stated that there was nothing wrong with this, but Ibrahim al-Nakhayi disliked it. Al-Qali, Hussein, al baghawi and others among our companions stated that there was nothing wrong with eating sweets or any other kind of food that had the Qur'an written on it. Al-Qadi also stated that it is disliked to burn a piece of wood with the Qur'an written on it. Now, فصل في حكم نقش القرآن على حيطان وثياب وفي حكم كتابة الحروز مذهبنا أنه يكره نقش الحيطان والثياب بالقرآن وبأسماء الله تعالى وقال عطاء لا بأس بكتب القرآن في قبلة المسجد وأما كتابة الحروز من القرآن فقال مالك لا بأس به إذا كان في قبصة أو جلد وحرز عليه وقال بعض أصحابنا إذا كتب في الحرز قرآنا مع غيره فليس بحرام ولكن لو لا تركه لكنه يحمل في حال الحدث وإذا كتب يصان بما قاله الإمام مالك رضي الله عنه وبهذا أفتى الشيخ أبو عمرو بن صلاح رحمه الله تعالى فصل في النفث مع القرآن للرقية روى ابن أبي داود عن أبي جحيفة الصحابي رضي الله عنه واسمه وهب بن عبد الله وقيل غير ذلك وعن الحسن البصري وإبراهيم النخعي وأنهم كرهوا ذلك 
والمختار وأن ذلك غير مكروه بل هو سنة مستحبة فقد ثبت عن عائشة فقد ثبت عن عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان كان إذا أوى إلى فراش كل ليلة جمع كفيه ثم نفث فيهما فقرا فيهما قل هو الله أحد وقل أعوذ برب الفلق وقل أعوذ برب الناس ثم يمسح بما ما استطاع من جسده يبدأ به ما على رأسه ووجهه وما أقبل من جسده يفعل ذلك ثلاث مرات رواه البخاري ومسلم في صحيحيهما وفي رواية في الصحيحين زيادة على هذا ففي بعضها قالت عائشة رضي الله قالت عائشة رضي الله عنها فلما اشتكى كان يأمرني أن أفعل ذلك به وقال في وفي بعضها كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ينفث كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ينفث You can say both ways. على نفسه في المرض الذي مات فيه بالمعوذات قالت عائشة فلما ثف فلما ثقل كنت أنفث أنفث عليه بهن وأمسح بيد نفسه لبركتها وفي بعضها كان إذا اشتكى يقرأ على نفسه بالمعوذات وينفث وينفث قال أهل اللغة النفث نفخ لطيف بلا ريق Section. According to the Shafi'i school of thoughts, it is disliked that walls be etched or clothes be embroidered with the verses of the Quran or the names of Allah. Atar stated that there is nothing wrong with writing the Quran on a wall that is in the direction of the qibla in a masjid. You see, some people write, "Qad nara taqalluba wajhika fi samai, fala nwali anna ka qibla tan tarbaha, fawali wajhak shatr al masjid al harami." Some places وأن المساجد لله فلا تدعو مع الله أحدا. In some places what they stick on is what they stick on it. They stick other verses of the Quran around the wall and calligraphy and stuff like that. According to the Shafi'i Madhab, is disliked for people to write down on walls and garments the Quran or the names of Allah. But Ata said there's no harm in writing it towards the Qibla. If it's in the Qibla side, no problem. Naam. رِجَالُ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِيْتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا تَتَقَلَّبُ فِيهُ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارِ They stick those kind of verses on the wall. Naam. As for writing the actual letters of the Quran, Malik, Malik was one of the views. Malik, Malik, Malik. Malik. Don't say it now like an Arabic, don't say it like a white guy. He's overdoing that one, isn't it? Malik, Malik. Sahan <laughs> Nasser, he's overdoing it. Now, when it comes to names, you don't have to say it like a white guy. The rest, we like you saying it the way you say it. You know, the way you say the rest is, is, is very Harry Potter version. But when you come to Malik, yeah. When it comes to Malik, say Malik, Malik, yeah, that's his name, that's his name, inshallah. Malik was of the view that this was permissible, provided that it was on a cane or skin, and then perforated or pierced into, so as to protect it from being scratched away or erased. Some of our companions were of the view that it is permissible to write the Qur'an down along with something else on an item that one carries around, but that it is better not to, because this might lead to it being carried around when one is in a state of ritual impurity. If it is written down, however, it should be preserved in, a ma in the manner described by Imam Malik, may Allah have mercy on him. This is also the verdict of Sheikh Abu Amr ibn al-Salah on the matter. Okay, Faslun, I read this one here as well. Section, on reciting the Quran and then blowing lightly for the purpose of treatment and guarding against evil. Ibn Abu Dawood, narrated that Abu Juhayfa, the companion of the Prophet وسلم, whose real name was said to be Wahib ibn Abdullah, there are other opinions as to what his real name was, Al-Hassan al-Basri and Ibrahim al-Nikhai used to dislike practice. Ibrahim al-Nikhai. 
Nachai. But the chosen and correct view is that it is not disliked and that it is, in fact, a recommended sunnah. Indeed, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, reports that upon grief getting into bed, into his bed, the Prophet وسلم, used to bring his palms together, blow into them, and recite Surah Al Ikhlas, Surah Al Falaq, and Surah Al Nas into them. Is it permissible for a person to blow when they're reading the Quran? Are you allowed to, to do that? Because we're going to see later what do the scholars consider, I mean, what's the meaning of the word and nafathu? He's going to bring it, which is what? It is nafkhun latifun bila riqin. It's like not like big stuff on the person. But you just little like that. Huh? Yeah, this is, yeah, some of the Sahabas used to permit the uh, Tamima that had Quran on it. They used to allow it, some of the Sahabas. There was a difference of opinion whether the Tamima can have Quran on it. There was a difference of opinion on that one. But the strongest is that it's not correct because there's no evidence for it. To have a Tamima connected to you, but there's conditions. It has to be Quran, it has to be clear, it has to be well, it has to be seen. Okay, okay, that's why, okay, clear. Not I and there's boxes on top of it and then little dots around it and you just like mixed with it. Whoa, 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 what's happening here? What's this box? You stay away from that stuff. And that's what these guys do a lot. They write an ayah, they'll cut the ayah up, they'll put some, 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 some box and some, you know. When I say box, I don't mean Chinese. I mean actually it is boxes. It's box, it's a house. It's round, it's circle, it's an arrow, arrow facing the other way, weird things that you think to yourself, this doesn't make sense. It's in the verse. This is not Quran. That's not what the Sahabas are talking about. The Sahabas are talking about somebody writing, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufun ahad. And then taking that, taking it, making a rope, putting it on themselves, is that permissible? Some Sahabas said, yeah, no problem. <coughs> but we dealt with that issue, that that view is weak. Recite Surah Al Ikhlas, Surah Al Falaq, and Surah Al Nas into them. He would then wipe what he could of his body with his palms, starting with his head, then his face, and what he could of the rest of his body. But he did this, and he did this three times. Both Al Bukhari and Muslim narrated this hadith. Other narrations of the same hadith, also included in the two authentic books, contain additional statements of Ali from Aisha, from May Allah be pleased with her, such as, and when he fell sick, he would tell me to do this for him. In other narrations, it is reported that the Prophet وسلم, used to recite Surah Al Falaq and Surah Al Nas and then blow into his palms and wipe over himself. Aisha, may Allah have mercy on her, said uh, and added, When he fell sick, I would blow after reciting them the two chapters and wipe over him with his own hands for the blessing. And in other narrations, it is reported. When he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fell sick, he would recite these two chapters and then blow into his palms. Scholars of the Arabic language have explained that the word naft, the Arabic word for blowing, and the word used by Aisha in the above hadith involves blowing lightly without spitting, and Allah knows best. So if somebody pours saliva over you, be careful, because stuff is not right, yeah? Don't allow that. All day. What are you doing to me? And another thing that it shows is that how the connection of the wife and the husband should be. Then when the wife senses that her husband is sick and he's used to do something, and she reads between the lines. Some woman, the, ma the man is eating and he doesn't want to trouble his wife. So there's, th th there's food stuck in his throat or something, you know? And he goes, <coughs> <coughs> he's hinting to his wife, can you please go get me water? She, she, just, she just doesn't get it. She's just sitting there looking at him. Yeah, wishkila, yeah. A problem when the husband gets sick and he's no he's in bed and he's lying uh, and <laughs> he's lying in bed and he's sick so what does he have to do he's lying and he's sleeping and he's in bed he used to read Quran on himself he used to what he used to read Quran on himself now that he's reading he never he can't do it anymore and he doesn't want to leave the 70,000 he doesn't want to ask her to do to do on him 
The wife should be smart and clever and say, honey, are you, have you got a headache? Okay, I'm going to read Quran on you. And she blows into her hands, which she can do if she wishes to, and wipe it over him fully. Or the opposite holds truth. That he, she takes his hands, she blows it into his hands, and she takes his hands and she wipes it over him. Both of those, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she used to do for the Prophet. This shows you that they were a family that were working towards the hereafter. And the deen was prevailing in their houses. You see? <coughs> الباب الثامن في الآيات والسور المستحبة في أوقات وأحوال مخصوصة اعلم أن هذا الباب واسع جدا لا يمكن حصر لكثرة ما جاء فيه لكثرة ما جاء فيه ولكن نشير إلى أكثره أو كثير منه بعبارات وجيزة فإن أكثر الذي نذكره فيه معروف لخاصة والعامة ولهذا لا أذكر الأدلة في أكثره فمن ذلك السنة كثرة الاعتناء بتلاوة القرآن في شهر رمضان وفي العشر الأخيرة منه أكثر وليال الوتر منه أكود ومن ذلك العشر الأول من ذي الحجة ويوم عرفة ويوم عرفة ويوم الجمعة وبعد الصبح وفي الليل وينبغي أن يحافظ على قراءة ياسين والواقعة وتبارك الملك فصل فيما يقرأ الإمام في الجمعة والعيدين السنة أن يقرأ في صلاة الصبح يوم الجمعة بعد الفاتحة في الركعة الأولى ألف لام تنزيل بكمالها وفي الثانية هل تعالى الإنسان بكمالها ولا يفعل ما يفعل كثير من أئمة المساجد من الاختصار على آيات من كل واحدة منهما مع تمطيط القراءة بل ينبغي أن يقرأهما بكمالها ويدرج قراءته مع الترتيل والسنة أن يقرأ في صلاة الجمعة في الركعة الأولى سورة الجمعة بكمالها وفي الثانية سورة المنافقون وفي الثانية سورة المنافقين بكمالها وإن شاء في الأولى سبح اسم ربك العلى وفي الثانية ألا تعالى الإنسان حين من الدار لم يكن شيئا مذكورا فكلاهما صحيح عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وليجتنب الاختصار على البعض وليفعل ما قدمنا والسنة أن يقرأ في صلاة العيد في الركعة الأولى سورة قاف وفي الثانية اقتربت الساعة بكمالها وإن شاء سبح اسمه وهل أتاك فكلاهما صحيح عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وليجتني بالاختصار على البعض نعم Chapter 8 Regarding verses and chapters that are recommended at specific times or on specific occasions It is important that it be understood that this is an extensive topic and that it is not possible to mention everything it entails due to the amount of information available, available on the subject. So here he's going to go into what we should, your daily routine, what surahs you need to read, what times that you need to read them, when they are recommended. So inshallah ta'ala, this is just something that we can go over fast inshallah ta'ala, that he's going to mention bi idhnillahi al-kareem. So we're mainly going to listen to the translation. We shall, however, point out most of that which falls under the subject or at least much of it by summarizing the contents. Given that much of what it contains is already known to both common people as well as students and teachers of knowledge, I have therefore opted not to include evidence for, what, uh, for much of what I shall state. It is of the Sunnah to be more concerned with the recitation of the Quran in the month of Ramadan, with special emphasis on the last 10 nights and even more emphasis on the odd-numbered odd nights of the last 10 nights. Other times when recitation is especially preferred, including the first ten and days and nights of Dhul Hijjah, the day of the day of Arafah, Friday, any day after dawn prayer, and during the night. It is also recommended that one recite Surah Surah Al Yasin, Al Waqiyah, and Al Mulk frequently. Section: As mentioned previously, it is of the Sunnah to recite the whole of Surah Al Sajda after reciting Al Fatiha in the first rak'ah of the dawn prayer and the whole of Surah, al Surah, al Surah al Insan after reciting al fatiha in the second rak'ah. One must not do what many Imams do by reciting just some verses from each Surah while excessively elongating their manner of recitation. Instead, one should recite each chapter, each chapter in its entirety with Tabtil. Uh, recitation with Tabtil has already been explained. Sikh the Sheikh uh, here, he mentions a very important thing which is some people, what they would do is, 
Surah Sajj on Friday, what's read? On Fajr of Friday, what's read? Surah Sajda and Surah to? Surah to Insan. Some people, mashallah, they want to read Surah to Sajda for so long and beautify it and go on board, overboard. And they just read Surah to Sajda. So what they've done is what? They left the Sunnah, which is to read Surah to Sajda and what? And to read Surah to Insan. He leaves off that practice. So what does he stick with? He does by sufficing himself with one of them. Or what he does is that the first raka'ah he reads a portion of Surah Sajda and the second raka'ah he reads a portion of Surah Al-Insan. That's incorrect. It's better that you stop this long lengthy recitation and this beautification that too much you're going into and it's better you read with moderation and you finish both swallows. As the Prophet would do alayhi salatu salam. It is also of the Sunnah to recite the whole of Surah Al-Insan with in the first rak'ah of the Friday prayer and Surah Al-Munafiqoon in the second rak'ah. If one so wishes, he may recite Surah Al-A'la in the first rak'ah of the Friday prayer and al ghashia in the second rak'ah. Both of these options are authentically reported practices of the Prophet Sallallahu and it is therefore best not to restrict oneself to practicing one option while completely disregarding the other. So some Jum'ahs, what you should try to do is, some Jum'ahs, what you should try to do is, read Surah uh, Al-Jum'ah, and the Surah Al-Munafiqoon. And other Jum'ahs, what you should try to do is, read Surah Surah Al-A'la, and Surah Al-Ghashiyah. But nowadays, SubhanAllah, because there's a consistent, everybody just wants to go khutbah, just leave the khutbah, all day they're looking at their time. They're looking at you. Are you there? and um, parking ticket, everybody's making sure that the car doesn't get a ticket because they parked in the wrong place. So the whole khutbah, subhanAllah, but the reality is that make your khutbah 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, but do 20 minutes prayer. That's the sunnah of the messenger, alayhi salatu So, and it is, it is ignorant to forget the, the, the people you're dealing with. The people you're dealing with and their jobs is that they have to leave. They have to go. They got work, they got jobs, they're gonna get sacked if, and this is the only time they can come to the masjid. So you need to get a khutbah ready for like for that time, like 30 minutes. So when they go to their work, they remember exactly what you were talking about, the bullet points, the points that you're driving home. Are you with me, brothers? Because of its importance now.